So a lot of my projects involve making custom electronic boards like this one. While I usually end up ordering more complicated ones from sites like JLC PCB, it's usually easier and quicker to just make one at home. In this video I'm going to focus on my favorite way of doing this by starting with a bare copper board like this one, some drill bits like these, and a CNC machine like this one. The CNC machine I'm using is a Carvera, though there are cheaper options that you can get on Amazon for just a few hundred dollars. They all do the same thing, but you may need to do more manual work uh, for changing out bits and so on. First, I should mention that the board I just showed isn't actually pure copper, but is mostly insulating fiberglass sandwiched between two very thin sheets of copper. FR4 fiberglass is the most common, but there is also FR1 fiberglass, which is easier to use if you're milling out PCBs like we are. So initially, we have effectively two separate wires on the top and bottom of the board. To make this more useful, we are going to be performing two main operations in order to make more discrete wires. First, we are going to cut out copper everywhere we don't want it to be to create isolated wires. Usually, you'll hear these called traces. Second, to support mixing the two copper layers, we are going to drill holes in the board and fill the empty space with more copper or some other conductive metal to connect the top and bottom layers. Before we can get started, we need to have already designed a board with software like KitKat. The most important parts of this picture are the red and blue layers, which represent the copper traces that we want connected together on the top and bottom sides of the board. If we are starting with the board uh, being entirely copper, we will need to cut out the dark parts in this picture. To do this, we're going to use a V-shaped engraving bit. The one I use has a 0.2 millimeter diameter tip and a 30 degree V angle. Since we can't get in an infinitely small bit, this size will limit how close our traces can be to each other. If we just drill into the board the bare minimum of 0.05 millimeters to clear the entire copper sheet, you can use some high school trigonometry to figure out that the best we can do is cut at least around 0.23 millimeters of space. But since the copper isn't going to be a consistent thickness and the machine isn't perfectly accurate, I'm going to cut down 0.1 millimeters. So the theoretical limit we get is around 0.25 millimeters of space clearance. In KitKat, I've used much more conservative settings and set the clearance limit to 0.3 millimeters between traces. Also note that the copper is just glued onto the fiberglass. So if a trace is too thin, it may end up coming off uh, with all the force we're applying around it. So I also limit the minimum trace width to 0.4 millimeters. Another thing you may have noticed is that on the back blue side, there are some large areas where there is no copper. So if we just naively cut out all this space, it will take a lot of time. Instead of doing this, we're just going to remove enough copper so that none of the traces touches any of the remaining copper in this area. To figure out how we can do this programmatically, let's just look at a single trace on our, on our board that we want to isolate from the rest of the board. From the geometry of the V-bit, we know the diameter of the tool and ideally we find a path that is half the diameter away from the trace's edge to perfectly cut out the trace. I did this in my program by extending rectangles of, of that width parallel to each line in the trace's edge. If we encounter an obtuse angle, we also need to draw a circle to handle this discontinuity. Then if you merge all the polygons together and follow the outer edge, you get your, your cut path. To further improve the isolation, you'd want to do this a few times at increasing distance away from the edge to make sure that there is a good amount of separation between all the copper. After you've done this for all the traces at once, the input to the CNC machine will be a text file which basically just contains a list of these points that we want to pass through to make all the cuts. Now it's time to actually start making the board. First we're going to tape the board to our CNC bed with some regular scotch double sided tape. This doesn't need to be very strong, but does need to be flat so I leave a bit of extra tape dangling off the edge of the board. Since we're cutting an extremely thin layer of copper that itself is not flat, we need our CNC to know exactly where the top of the board is. To do this, we'll start by picking up a probing tool which is basically a button that presses down when we hit the board to collect a height map of the board. Later when milling, we offset all of our movements in the Z up-down direction by these height values. If you have one of the cheaper CNC's, you do this by connecting a wire to the board and another to any regular drill bit 
and going down until the two make an electrical contact. Now we will switch to our engraving bit and cut out all the traces on the top level. Note that whenever we switch tools, we are measuring the height of each tool relative to the other using a button similar to the probing process so that we know their relative position to the top of the copper. Usually when I make these boards, I use a vacuum attachment on my CNC, so it's not very interesting to see. But for YouTube, here's another close-up shot uh, without the vacuum on. Observant viewers may have noticed that our board is still copper colored, while most boards out in the wild are green. The green layer is called solder mask and is basically just fancy ink. To add the ink to our board, we are going to start by laying down a layer of green ink and letting it dry. The board wouldn't be very useful if all the copper was covered, as we want to later attach components to the copper at specific points. Also note that we still haven't finished wiring up these vias, so we will need to remove the mask on them as well. To get rid of the unwanted mask, we're going to use a modified engraving bit that is attached to a spring so that depending on how hard we press, we can adjust the pressure on the surface. This works because the ink is much softer than the copper. KitKat conveniently gives us another layer telling us exactly where we want to exclude the solder mask. So we can use the same process as we did to isolate the copper, but in reverse. To apply the ink in real life, I first sand down the copper board and then use a silk screen and a squeegee to apply the ink. You only need a single layer and ideally just one wipe pass. Since we're going to be flipping the board over later, if there are any extra pools of ink on the side, you want to clean it off so that the board can lay flat when flipped. To cure the ink, we use a UV lamp and a bunch of hot air to cure it in less than 3 minutes. The majority of my fail attempts have been due to this not being cured enough, so take your time. Now we'll do the cutting. And once it's done, we can clean it off with some isopropyl alcohol to see the result. The next steps are a bit unique to how I do it. First, we'll partially drill through all of our via holes. We can't fully drill through these holes to avoid conflicting with the solder mask removal process on the backside. But by drilling them out partially, we cheat a little bit just in case the second side is misaligned with the top copper since it's better for any misalignment to show up inside the fiberglass than on the copper. Then we will drill out alignment holes that go all the way through. We'll use these to align the two sides of the board later. These are special holes that I added that don't need solder mask removed around them so we can safely drill them all the way through the board. The front side of the board is now done, and now we have to flip over the board to do all the back operations. But we need to do this very precisely since we need all of our traces on the bottom layer to align with the top layer. Most people use physical pins to do this, but I just use a camera. First, using the camera, I move the CNC over each alignment hole and measure the position in X and Y on the top side of the board. Then I'll remove the board and flip it over. As you can see, the alignment holes made a mark on the back side of the board, so we'll do the same thing as we did on the top side and record the position of the corresponding holes on the back side of the board. Now, in the software that generates our cut paths for the backside, we'll need to solve this basic matrix equation to figure out how points in our front coordinate space map to our back coordinate space using the four alignment points 
on the front and back of the board that we've found. We can solve for x by finding the pseudo-inverse of the f matrix and then multiplying it with both sides. And this is the bottom matrix I got for the PCB we are making. The numbers are roughly what you'd expect. The negative 1 value means that we flip the board over its x-axis. There is also a slight amount of rotation since we didn't perfectly flip the board, and the x and y origins are shifted over a bit since our board wasn't centered in the copper sheet. Milling the back is basically a repeat of all the previous operations except we will multiply all of our cut points by the alignment matrix we just found. And now we are done with all the milling parts. An optional step at this point is to drop the PCB in a tin plating solution to improve solderability, but that's fairly hazardous so I usually avoid it. Next we're going to solder on all these surface mounted components onto our board. You've probably picked up on the pattern by now that KitKat also gives us a layer for exactly where to put all the solder. If you order a professionally made PCB, you have the option of ordering a metal stencil like this through which you can squeegee solder paste through. These are professionally made using a high power laser and trying to cut them on a CNC tends to fail since the stencil is very flexible and tends to bend rather than get cut. So instead, I got some 4mm Mylar sheets off Amazon and cut them on a cheaper CO2 laser cutter. These are sandwiched between wet pieces of printer paper to reduce the amount of fraying on the edges of the cuts. Then I place the board in this 3D printed vacuum box. The stencil goes on top. And once I'm comfortable with the alignment of the stencil and the board, I crank up the vacuum and the stencil sticks in one place on the board. Then we just have to squeegee out some solder paste. and finally take the board out. Now the board is nicely covered with solder paste. Next, using a vacuum suction tool, I'll take the components and place them on the board. To harden the solder, we'll put the board into an oven and ramp up to 250 degrees Celsius. And now all the components are firmly attached. Now we basically need to do the same thing for any components on the other side. And if you're wondering why the components on the first side don't fall off when we heat the board in the oven for the second time, it's because I used a lower temperature melting point solder paste that melts at around 160 degrees Celsius the second time. Next we're going to go back to the bench to make the connections between the front and back copper layers in the via holes. To do this I put these standard one by one male header pins in the top side, hold them in place with some foam or putty, and solder them on the back side board. <laughs> 
Then we can flip to the front of the board, trim down the pins. And solder them on that side. Note that we still need to hold the pins in place from the opposite side to avoid them falling out from gravity where the solder remelts. The alternative way to do this is to use some copper rivets like these. You will need to drill a larger than average hole to use them and then you'll need to ha find some special punch tools to use them. The rivets are much harder to find online as specialty tools are very expensive for the smaller sized rivets so I only use them for bigger holes where the standard uh, center punch tool works fine. The last steps are just to solder all the regular connectors and through hole components. And now we're done. If you're interested in finding out what this board actually does, you'll have to subscribe since it will make another appearance in a future video.